الملك فيصل وفي 2015 تعاوننا مع شركة أرامكو السعودية في تنفيذ ندوة على هذا النبات قسم البيئة في أرامكو يعني سأل إحنا إيه اللي ممكن نقدمه ويكون غير تقليدي يفيد في الأراضي الهامشية الأراضي القحلة استهلاك أقل للمياه خدمة البيئة فما لقيناش أحسن من نموذج الجيجوبا أن إحنا نعمل عليه ندوة دولية بالتعاون مع أرامكو تم تنفيذها في 2017 طبعا كان فيها شركات على مستوى العالم خبراء على مستوى العالم والحمد لله كان لها صدى كبير جدا وبالفعل كان تفكير الجامعة هو كيفية الاستفادة والاستثمار وبدأ بالفعل تنفيذ برنامج متكامل للبحث العلمي وللاستثمار في نبات الجوجوبا عشان نتكلم على الجوجوبا لازم نعرف ان احنا الاراضي اللي حوالينا كلها معظمها اراضي قاحله اراضي هامشيه نسبه الملوحه فيها مرتفعه درجات الحراره مرتفعه جدا وخاصه في المناطق الشرقيه اللي ممكن يتم فيها عمليات الزراعه دي من النواحي خدمه البيئه والاقلمه واستخدامها في وقف وزحف الرمال والاشياء الكثيره اللي ممكن نتكلم فيها النواحي الاقتصاديه برضو كان لها عامل مهم جدا استخدامات زيوت الجوجوبا العالم كله عرف قيمة الجوجوبا وخاصة بعض الدول على مستوى العالم دلوقتي بتنتج من الجوجوبا وبتقوم عليها صناعات كتير جدا. كان في تفكير في نفس الوقت عندنا، احنا ايه اللي ممكن نستخدمه؟ وعرفنا قد ايه قيمة الجوجوبا وزيت الجوجوبا اللي بيحتوي على 55% من حجم البذرة زيوت يمكن استخدامها. نوعية الزيت نفسه زيوت شمعية يعني لها تطبيقات كتير جدا وزي ما هنشوف وهنجمل دلوقتي احنا فكرنا في ايه في جامعة الملك فيصل في رقم واحد في ايجاد نبات يتأقلم على البيئة السعودية في سواء كان الاراضي الهامشية استخدام مياه الري او مياه الصرف المعالج كل الاشياء استعنا ببعض الشركات المصرية الصديقة واللي قدمت بالفعل خدمات جليلة للجامعة ان احنا نشوف النماذج اللي عملوها عندهم نماذج ناجحة جدا في مصر في مجال زراعة نبات الجوجوبا واستخدام مياه الصرف ودي كانت من التجارب اللي يعني بالفعل شدتنا وجذبتنا ان احنا نكمل في هذا الاتجاه. كل الدراسات اللي كانت بتاكد لنا معلومه واحده ان النبات ده واعد وهنشوف دلوقتي ليه كلمه واعد لان احنا من يوم ما ادخلناه الى المملكه اثبت يعني نجاح وتاقلم، طبعا شفنا البذره وشفنا الاستخدامات الموجوده عليها، انا مش عاوز اطول في المقدمه، عاوز اخش على التنفيذ نفسه للمشروع. موضوع الملوحة وكان لنا أول تجربة أن احنا يبقى عندنا بحث علمي وهنشوف التفاصيل بتاعته أن احنا نأكد ونعزل الجين الخاص بمقاومة الملوحة من نبات الجوجوبا وده يؤكد بالفعل أن الجوجوبا اللي كان بتكلم على أنها بتتحمل 3000 جزء في المليون لا 6000 جزء في المليون وهناك كلام على أن احنا ممكن نزود يعني قدرة الجوجوبا بنفس هذا الجين يعني بيزود الاكسبريشن بتاعه في نماذج كتير جدا شفناها وتمت زيارتها وتم التاكد من نجاح الجوجوبا فيها والصناعه بالنسبه لنا برضو كانت عامل مهم جدا خدمه البيئه ان نبات ايفر جرين يعني طول العام في اخضرار وكميه الاوراق الموجوده فيه واستهلاكها لسان اكسيد الكربون دي كلها تجارب ودراسات اتعملت عشان تؤكد اهميه النبات ده واهميه دوره في المستقبل واللي ممكن يكون من النواحي دي حضراتكم ده الزيت الخاص بالجوجوبا واللي قدرنا نشوف ونتاكد من شركات كتير جدا مدى احتياجها ليه سواء كان في الصناعات التجميليه اليوبريك او في التحمل واستخدام زيوت المحركات او في الوقود الحيوي والنظره المستقبليه ليه لزيت الجوجوبا في الاستخدامات العديده. بناء على كده كانت قرار جامعه الملك فيصل انها بالفعل تستثمر في هذا المجال وبناء على الندوه اللي تمت عندنا اتفاق كان حصل اتفاق مع الشركه المصريه الخليجيه اللي قدمت بالفعل حوالي 10000 نبات لجامعه الملك فيصل وتم شراء برضو عدد مماثل وبدانا بالفعل احضار النباتات ديت سيبناها فتره عشان نشوف الاقلمه بتاعتها ومدى تحملها وبدانا في عمليه الاعداد للاكسار ليها برضو بالبذره وبالعقل وبدانا ننفذ البرنامج متكامل لزراعه اراضي محطه الابحاث في جامعه الملك فيصل حوالي 20 هكتار باستخدام هذه النباتات المرحلة اللي حضراتكم بنشوفها دي تمت في شهور يعني يوليو اغسطس وهي درجات الحرارة فيها بتكون في اعلى ما يكون وبالفعل النباتات الحمد لله 
اثبتت فعاليه ونجاح في الفتره ديت اللي احنا كلنا عمرنا ما كنا نتوقع النظره ديت للنبات. وتم تنفيذ حوالي زي ما بقول لحضراتكم 20 هكتار المرحله دي كانت من حوالي سنتين يعني 2020 النهارده دي النباتات اللي موجوده عندنا واللي بالفعل تحمل محصول ويمكن احنا في المعرض هنا عندنا بذور وزيوت من النباتات دي اصبح عندنا منتج بالفعل بعد سنتين من زراعه النبات ده اللي اصبح ان هو متحمل لكل الظروف الغير مناسبه اللي بتحيط بيه وخاصه حضراتكم تعلموا منطقه الاحساء ودرجه الحراره المرتفعه والتربه اللي احيانا قد تكون غير مناسبه طيب المرحله التاليه ان التطبيقات احد اهم التطبيقات اللي احنا فكرنا فيها اللي هو عمليه التشميع دول كتير جدا في المرحله ديت بتعاني من المنتجات اللي بتستخدمها في عمليه التشميع الخاصه بالثمار المعدل التصدير كان الاتجاه لاستخدام المنتجات الطبيعيه احد هذه المنتجات هو زيت الجوجوب وبالفعل بعد فتره من التجارب اثبت نجاحه يعني هنقول ان احنا عندنا انتي فانجل انتي بكتيريا انت حاجات كتير جدا للزيت وواضح جدا على مستوى استخدامه في ثمار مختلفه قد ايه نجاح التجربه واللي ان شاء الله بنطبقها دي احد التجارب اللي هي مهتمه بها برضو شركه ارامكو اللي هي استخدام زيوت الجوجوبه في مقاومه التاكل والصدا وبالفعل استخدام زيت الجوجوبه مقارنه بالزيوت العاديه وبالميه واضح قد ايه الفروق واضح قد ايه ان زيت الجوجوبه اثبت فعاليه في الجزئيه ديت ودي ان شاء الله يعني المرحله التاليه اللي احنا بنكملها يعني ان شاء الله مع ارامكو لاستخدام الزيوت ده في التطبيقات المختلفه بالصدا في 2015 انا كنت حصلت على جائزه خليفه الدوليه في موضوع تحديد الجنس في النخيل وتم نشر البحث الخاص بيها وتم تسجيل براءات الاختراع وبالفعل قلنا هل الجوجوبه نفس المشكله لان احنا عندنا معظم النباتات ثنائيه الجنس المذكر والمؤنث بتبقى في صعوبه انك تعرف او تحدد الموضوع ده في مرحله مبكره ولا غالبا تنتظر الى من ثلاث الى اربع سنوات وفي النخيل قد تكون اكثر ف ليه احنا محتاجينها في الجوجوبه وليه كده؟ لان احنا محتاجين احيانا نباتات مذكره عشان نصمم الحقول فبنحتاج ان احنا يكون عندنا نباتات مذكره من البدايه نقدر واحنا بنزرع نرتب فيها التخطيط بتاع الحقول. فالحمد لله وصلنا في المرحله السابقه ان احنا يبقى عندنا كيتس تستخدم في النخيل لتحديد الجنس ودي ان شاء الله في القريب العاجل هيكون بيتم كوميرشاليزيشن بالنسبه لها وانها تبقى موجوده في السوق ان احنا نقدر نستخدمها مع النخيل. وسجلنا طبعا بيها براءة اختراع في النخيل. النهارده في الجوجوبه ديت الصوب اللي ناتج البذره بالنسبه للجوجوبه قدرنا نعزل الجين المسؤول عن تحديد الجنس برضه في الجوجوبه وهو نفسه الجين اللي هو الاس ار واي نفس اللي موجود في الهيومن وقدرنا نعزل الجين ده ونعرف السيكونس الخاص بيه وبالفعل ثبتنا وان شاء الله في في يناير القادم هتكون البحث الثاني في هذا المجال منشور على الجوجوبه وتحديد الجنس فيها و في بحث بيشمل معظم النباتات ثنائيه الجنس برضه احنا بنعده على اساس ان احنا نقدر نقول ان احنا عندنا دلوقتي الكيتس الخاصه بتحديد الجنس في كل النباتات ثنائيه الجنس. احد المواضيع المهمه بالنسبه لنا الملوحه ودي كانت من ضمن الاشياء اللي احنا بنركز عليها ان احنا يبقى عندنا بالفعل قدره على ان احنا نعزل الجين ده ونشوفه موجود في النبات ولا لا ونقدر في يوم من الايام نعمل له كوميرشاليزيشن او ننقله لنباتات اخرى وهكذا، وبالفعل عزلنا من من الجوجوبه جين الجلاي 1 وعملنا تجارب باستخدام التركيزات مختلفه من الصوديوم كلورايد وقدرنا نعرف مدى تحمل نبات الجوجوبه وبقول لحضراتكم ان هي تصل الى اكثر من 6000 جزء في المليون وتم تاكيد الدراسات وتم عزل الجين وايداعه في بنك الجينات وبالتالي ان احنا اصبح عندنا من الجوجوبه جين التحديد الجنس اللي هو الاس ار واي والجين الثاني اللي هو الجلايو ده طبعا بالنسبه للجزء الملوكلر وقدرنا دلوقتي ان احنا نشوف ايه الاصناف من الجوجوبه اللي تاقلمت واللي اصبحت يعني نقدر نقول انتاجيتها وشكلها ونموها الخضري متاقلم على المناخ في المملكه وبنعمل سلكشن للاصناف ديت علشان خاطر نبدا بعد كده نعمل لها اكسار سريع في زراعه الانسجه دخلنا بالفعل بعض النباتات المنتخبه وعملنا استابلشمنت للتيشو كلتشر بالنسبه لها و وصلنا للمالتيبليكيشن باعداد الحمد لله كويسه جدا ومرحله التجزير دي برضو كانت من اصعب المراحل اللي ممكن اي حد يقابلها وخصوصا مع نبات يعني يعتبر جديد في المجال ده واصبحت عندنا نباتات بالفعل متاقلمه قدرنا نقدر نطلعها ونقدر نستخدمها في عمليه الزراعه لان هي اصناف 
منتخبه لها الانتاجيه العاليه لها النمو المتاقلم مع البيئه وده كان شيء مهم جدا طبعا اشتركنا في معرض في ارامكو على استخدام الجوجوبا واللي اصبح لها وده تعاون برضو مع ارامكو في المرحله اللي جايه في عمليه الصدأ والتاكل ان شاء الله وما زالت الابحاث بتؤكد ان احنا قدام نبات كنز لاستخداماته المختلفه سواء كان في النواحي الصناعيه او الزراعيه خدمه البيئه اللي احنا كلنا بندور عليها التاقلم وان شاء الله يكون واعد ونقدر نتوسع فيه باذن الله شكرا لحضراتكم شكرا لك دكتور الان مع الدكتور الدكتور كايل فليتفضل السلام عليكم مد اسف انا لا اتكلم عربي لكن اي هوب ذاتس اوكي فور يو اي موفت هير 3 ييرز اجو اند تراينج بت اتس ا فيري كومبليكيتد لانجويج از يو نو اتس نايس تو بي هير توداي ثانك يو فور ذا اورجانايزرز فور انفايتينغ مي ماي نيم از بروفيسور كايل لاورسون اند اي ورك ات كاوست ام شور يو اول نو وير كاوست از وي هاف ا فيري بيوتيفول فيو And my lab is called Sustainable and Synthetic Biotechnology. So we focus on many different technologies that involve circularity and the development of circular bioeconomy. But a lot of that work is on microalgae and algal technology. So today, myself and Professor Claudio Grunwald are here to discuss the future of algal technologies in the kingdom and how they can contribute to agriculture and agricultural practices and circular economy. I think everybody in this room understands and appreciates the unique environment of the kingdom. And the unique environment can be considered quite extreme, but it can also be considered as an opportunity for development and an opportunity for unique development in the biological sciences. So in around the coast of the Red Sea where we live, we have a lot of non-arable land and we have a lot of seawater. Those two things are generally not considered Uh, great inputs for plant growth, but they are perfect for the development of algal technologies. And so KAUST has four foci, food, water, energy, and environment. And it's my job to realize the biological potential of microalgae and their diversity in that local environment. So here I just have a little photo that I'm going to expand in a second, but it's my opinion, and I think as well as Dr. Claudio Grunwald's, that the kingdom can actually be a leader in algal technologies in the next five years. We have an incredible potential for development of algal technologies, and we have the perfect conditions, especially on the coasts. So you may think of the extreme environment around us as probably not great for plants, and we just heard about some amazing adaptations of Yehoba oil for these tough conditions. But actually, if you give the right irrigation, plants love living here. Plants love the light intensity. Plants love the environment and the temperature. And this is my backyard. I like to show it just because it's green. And it's our goal to do a different type of green at scale to make algae the next source of um, agricultural production and one part of the grander solutions towards sustainability. It's not the only one, but it's a very important one moving forward. So this photo is, or these photos are just photobioreactors that are containers for growing algal cultures where they're taking nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers or wastewater, carbon dioxide, and converting it into their biomass. And the end goal, thank you, the end goal of algal technologies is to get to a biomass that looks something like this. It's a powdered 
plant biomass, and it has multiple colors, which you can see, which come from the different pigments of the biomass, but they're also sources of oils, proteins, carbohydrates, and many other specialty chemicals. So my lab is called Sustainable and Synthetic Biotechnology, and throughout my talk, if there's anything you want more information on, there, there are little QR codes that you can hold up your phone, and as long as you're connected to the internet, it will take you to the papers or the pages that I'm talking about. Because we're the only dedicated biotechnology lab for algae in the region, we try and cover all of the different technologies. And I mean, you see the diversity in technologies for agriculture here at this expo. You, are you building a tractor? Are you making fertilizer? Are you growing plants? Are you growing chicken? For us, algal technologies is a very big field. And so we try and cover bioprospecting of new species. We try and engineer those new species. We try and then build the cultivation units to then grow those species. And we try and figure out where to best place our cultivation units, given local uh, resources of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So as I've mentioned, algae take rather simple inputs and turn them into rather complicated outputs. And those complicated outputs have value in that powdered biomass. You can use it as a protein feed for animals. You can take the oils out of it, just like for the oil coatings from Yehoba oil. Uh, you can use those oils from algae to do the same thing. And you can get pigments and starch. And in general, it's a highly valuable biomass that's very specialized. It's been my research for the last 10 years to try and figure out ways to expand that biomass value by adding uh, genetic engineering to the game. And so genetic engineering in algae is quite challenging, and we've been very successful at accomplishing a lot with genetic engineering in, this, in these organisms. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of those things in the next slides. We're able to do this because over the last five, ten years, it's, been, it's become more and more affordable and more and more practical to treat DNA just like a chemical. We can synthesize any sequence we want, and therefore we can design in a computer and then adapt physically a piece of DNA that will work with algal genomes in a way that was not possible before. So now we can really use the tools collectively known as synthetic biology to make different um, algae do what we want them to do. And so an example of this is where we have a plant that's producing a natural product, like a medicine or a perfume product, and we can take the genes from that organism and adapt them to the alga, and then start making the exact same chemical in the algal biomass or as a part of the algal cultivation system. Now, the goal there is not to replace the use of algal biomass. So, for example, if we want to make protein for animal feed, we don't want to now make just algae to make a perfume, for example. We want to do it in addition to the actual biomass, and we want to milk that product separately from the actual biomass. And we do this in uh, what we call design, build, test, learn cycles. This is just the iterative process of science that we all know. We do a lot of things with high technology in our lab. The engineering of algae is a numbers game, and so we require robotics handling, which we're very lucky to have the support of the kingdom to do at KAUST. You can see some colony picking robots and manipulating robots working in my lab here. And we've also developed a lot of high throughput screening technologies that allow us to rapidly identify genetic engineered algae, uh, even at the agar plate level, so that we can go faster with these iterative cycles. So this is an example where we're expressing a yellow fluorescent protein, and robotically handled colony picking has allowed us to deal with a lot more mutants than we normally would in, uh, in our engineering efforts. <clears throat> Over the last 10 years, we've been able to show quite some different advances in products that we can get from engineered algae. We've been able to make diterpene medicines. We've been able to secrete recombinant proteins. We've been able to even modify the pigments of the algae to produce non-native pigments. One of my favorite uh, topics that I always talk about is a perfume that we've made from algae. And I actually have a sample of it here in my pocket. So later, if you want, you can come and smell this perfume as long as you promise to give it back. And we're working towards producing Oud, the perfume that we all know and love that's used in Bahur and in the perfume because its production is unsustainable as it is currently harvested from the wild. So we're working on this kind of advanced technology using carbon dioxide and waste nitrogen and phosphorus inputs to make these specialty products. There's a lot of technological advances that have to come once we have these new cells. So all of the infrastructure that we use to cultivate algae is optimized to make more algal biomass but not actually get these specialty chemicals out. And so when we're talking about 
plants, these specialty chemicals accumulate in the hairs and the, the tissues of the plants. I'm sure we've all touched a mint leaf before and your fingers smell like mint. It's because those little hairs accumulate the mint um, chemical and then uh, the, the uh, limonene chemical that's in the, in the mint and then it breaks and it's on your fingers. But single-celled algae actually don't have any structures to put those chemicals in. So when we're producing them, what we actually have to do is come up with new engineering systems to interact the cells with different chemicals, solvents, green solvents, so that we can milk away these products as the cells are growing. These are examples in my lab of different membrane technologies, hollow fiber membrane technologies, where we have the culture on one side, a solvent on another side, and we're able to continuously extract a product. And so in addition to developing these cells that are producing something new, we have to engineer systems to actually then produce those products because there's nothing on the market for us yet. And so this is an example if you want to look at that QR code of a process that we've developed to do just that using membranes, low energy, and green solvents. Speaking of green solvents, we've also discovered that there are other types of solvents we can use, not the traditional ones, but heavy oils, things that are completely inert that allow us to do this in a, in a better way and come up with new designs. This is just an illustrative video of one of our cultures being uh, producing a, a product that's then going into that heavy oil that's underneath. Uh, underneath the culture. So what this looks like in the future that we can see or that we can think of and we've already modeled is that let's say we're using algae to clean nitrogen and phosphorus from wastewater and we've shown very well that our algal cells grow in um, anaerobic membrane digestate clean water that has nitrogen and phosphorus in it. We can at the same time milk a co-product while producing algal biomass and generating clean water that then allows us to kind of offset the costs of operating those processes. So we calculated that without even factoring in the biomass that we get out of this process, we can add about a dollar of revenue to every thousand of liters of wastewater that is purified in this process. So that may not sound like a lot, a dollar per thousand liters, but when we talk about wastewater, we're talking about millions of liters of water. And so that kind of makes the economics a little bit more favorable in addition to contributing to the overall bioeconomy and greening of the bioeconomy, as we would say. So it's been our job to think about future-focused ways that once we have algal technology established in the kingdom, how can we really enhance that value? How can we make more value from algal cultivation uh, at scale? And uh, Dr. Grunwald is going to talk about uh, the installations that we're doing at KAUST, uh, funded by MIWA. But I just want to give you this one last example. So what you see here is not a brown soup, or it's not lentil soup, it's actually a green algal culture. But that green algal culture has been engineered to produce a red pigment called astaxanthin. And astaxanthin is the red pigment that makes shrimp red, it makes flamingos red, and makes salmon red. So you can see here that the green alga is now producing both green pigments and red pigments. So that makes green plus red equals brown but it's also engineered to produce a volatile hydrocarbon. So this cell is producing isoprene into its headspace. And so we can harvest each of these products separately while cleaning water, while taking the nitrogen and phosphorus directly by growing these cells using carbon dioxide as, as a carbon source. So we're very excited about this kind of combined engineering technology to develop new cell systems, new ways of cultivating algae, and new ways of converting waste into product. So that's all well and good. Those are nice future-focused technologies, but what are we actually doing for the kingdom that matters right now? And this is where I get really excited because what we're doing is, together with Claudio's team and funded by the Cow Circular Carbon Initiative, Dr. Barbara de Freitas in my lab has been working on isolating novel strains that come from the local environment. This is important for a lot of reasons, especially uh, biosecurity reasons. You don't want to be importing a lot of foreign species into your country but also because the metabolisms here have evolved to deal with the high UV, high light intensity, high temperatures that you get in the different environments. And so we're working very aggressively on getting these strains ready to go into the outdoor facilities that Claudio is going to talk about in his next talk. And we've already isolated over 50 different species just from in and around Kaust and Al-Waha, uh, Al uh, no, what is it? The crater, the moon crater, al Waba crater, sorry. Um, and, and the Red Sea. And this grows every week, so we're adding about five species a week to this number. And we're doing full genome sequencing. We're going to make a database that's freely accessible to all kingdom partners. So if you want to use any of these species that we've isolated, 
you're more than welcome to. We will give them to you, and in fact, if you have any isolates, we'd be really happy to take them and put them as part of this collection and make a kingdom-wide resource, both genetically from the sequences, but also One for the physical left. strains that we keep alive and healthy. One in minute left. Thank you. I'm finishing. Thank you. Medasif. So the one thing, one, one minute, sorry. The, the one thing that we have technologically that is very valuable in our lab is the largest suite of photobioreactors in the world for an academic lab. And we can program them with local weather data so that we can model performance in winter, spring, summer, fall for different species. And we do this, um, at, at least we've done it with Thule weather uh, north of Jeddah. And you can see, for example, this green alga does really well in the summertime, but the red alga does only really well in the winter. And this kind of data is super important before we take the strains outdoors and grow them at scale to predict in advance what's going to be our summer strain, our autumn strain, and that sort of thing. So this is an example here of an extremophile red alga that loves 42 degrees in pH 2. And it's growing really, really well outdoors in August conditions at KAUST. So you can see already that this kind of modeling is already being very predictive because we know that the strain can do well in advance before it goes out into the lab. And maybe Dr. Claudio will uh, talk about this in, uh, in a little more detail. So to wrap up my talk, we do a lot of high technology stuff with engineering algae to make them do new things, but we're also trying to contribute to kingdom biodiversity and kingdom um, bioeconomy. And so I think that the coasts of the kingdom especially have an incredible value moving forward for developing such technology. And uh, we, we're just at the beginning now. So, you know, uh, I moved here right before COVID happened. Then COVID happened, and we all remember how fun that was. But now we're really in a place where we can be very excited about the future and our development. And I think in three years, we will actually probably outcompete Europe in terms of our ability to produce algae and uh, do this kind of te technology. So this is my research group at KAUST. We're very international, but have a lot of Saudi students as well. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. الآن مع الآخر المحاضرات ولا والدكتور كلاديو All right. Well, uh, thank you very much to the organizer for the invitation uh, to this Saudi uh, agricultural business forum. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, a project that we are developing is a funded project by MIWA. Uh, and the idea of this is uh, basically to not rely on the importation of uh, feed for animals or raw material for feed for animals. Right? So um, as uh, Kyle explained, so what we are doing, we are working together in order to uh, bring this technology, establish this technology in the kingdom and try to uh, produce uh, the biomass for several purposes, not only for a feed for animal, but also for biostimulant for plant or for other high value application. Right? Um, why algal reduction? Uh, so basically because uh, this aligns with all the vision 2030 uh, of, of the kingdom, also Saudi Green Initiative, and, and, and we have a, an, a strategic uh, country because at the very end, this, uh, this country has a lot of potential in terms of uh, solar irradiation, in terms of CO2, in terms of not arable land. So uh, this the, is, is a beautiful country in terms of uh, algae production. Right? Also, we have a really uh, um, several universities that are working in, in different fields. Uh, we have also the support of the government, so everything is in place to establish this technology and to help the country to move ahead uh, in terms of food security. So this is a, a slide that I would like to show you, and later on you will see uh, how important it is. Right? This is a really recent uh, paper published uh, in Oceanography, and as you can see in the um, warm up A, this is the um, projected annual biomass, microalgae biomass production in the world. As you can see in um, uh, our country, in, in, in the kingdom, uh, we have a, a potential to produce over 80 to uh, 90 um, tons uh, per hectare per year. Right? So in terms of annual protein production, uh, we should be able to produce uh, roughly uh, 35 or, or even more uh, tons uh, per year. 
So later on, I will show you with uh, real data because these are projection only. These are modeling, but we, I will explain to you what we are obtaining currently and at COWS in our uh, facilities. Uh, in terms of algae, the current algae production worldwide is mainly dominated by seaweed. All right? Seaweed is uh, the, the most um, important seafood in the world. Actually, uh, there is over 32 million tons of production in 2021. Uh, and seaweed, seaweed uh, products, alginate, uh, carrageenan, and all the uh, gels that is, is everywhere, you know, so uh, specifically, well, from toothpaste to um, uh, food, uh, it's, it's everywhere. So um, it's, it's widely used in the industry, food industry, uh, but also there is a production in terms of microalgae. Our project is focused in both, in microalgae and seaweed. Okay, in terms of uh, microalgae production, as you can see in this table, uh, the, the biggest producer in the world is uh, China, and especially producing spirulina, which is the target strain that we are using to produce protein. Uh, as you can see, they are producing more than uh, 54,000 tons of, of, of this um, uh, biomass. And then uh, there are some uh, European countries that they are producing, but uh, not that much. Right? So uh, as you can see uh, in, in this data from 2019, uh, uh, KSA is not uh, represented in here, and we hope by next year, potentially we will be, as you can see later on, in the top five production of, of, of this uh, biomass. Uh, this is a, um, a video that I would like to show you. Um, I think it, uh, is this gonna play now? Yes, so this is a video uh, of the facility. We start from scratch in March uh, uh, the 8th, of this year, uh, uh, so we have um, constructed, designed and constructed and built this uh, uh, 1,000 square meter pilot plant at Kaos, all right? It took us around 107 days uh, to go from zero to uh, um, start the culture. Uh, we have different uh, production system. We have railways unit, uh, we have a PBR units, uh, research unit as well, a full uh, lab in, in order to uh, to double check all the parameters. And as you can see now, um, and later on I will show you, this um, is in, in current production, right? This is the team uh, of the people that uh, um, work with us, right? So this is the actual uh, current production. This is a picture of uh, two days ago. Uh, these are the open system. Uh, as you can see, we are growing Arthrospira maxima. The beauty of this one is that uh, this is a bacteria that normally uh, grow in fresh water. It's, a, it's, a, it's an algae that uh, basically is, um, is a grass algae, generally recognized as safe. You can buy this algae here in the KSA, but uh, normally it's produced mainly in China. So what we have done, we have adapted Atrospira maxima to the Red Sea salinity. So now we are, uh, we can consider that this is the most sustainable way to produce Atrospira because everywhere in the world they produce by using fresh water and we are producing the algae by, by using uh, um, Red Sea salinity, Red Sea water. As you can see in the image, uh, there is a really healthy and, and um, no contaminant with no contaminant in this uh, open system. But also what we do as well, uh, the spirulina is mainly for protein production, but also we need to include in fit for animal lipids, right? That is why we are targeting these three species in order to grow uh, to get the fatty acid. Nanochlorosis for eicosapentanoic acid, porphyridium purpurium for arachidonic acid, and uh, marine protein that is called Scytogidrium for DHA production because when we want to do a customized uh, um, a feed for animal, depending on the nutritional requirement of the animal, we need to combine in a different proportion uh, a protein uh, and uh, fatty acid. Uh, we can control all the parameters in this uh, 1,000 liter reactor each, and, and, and basically we can reach in, in seven to 10 days uh, a density of around two um, gram per liter or two kilograms per cubic meter right, of dry biomass. Uh, these are the, the current data. As you can see, we have been uh, growing the algae for the last four months. Uh, and as you can see, we have a, a really nice um, um, production. There is five rate with running. Currently, uh, uh, you will see as well that um, the abiotic parameters are, are quite harsh for other uh, algae. The average temperature is around 34, 35 degrees, and, and the pH is around nine. Uh, 
Um, and we are getting a, a production of around uh, 0 0.7 kilogram per cubic meter, right? Which is pretty good if you compare, if you uh, compare to other production in other country, the, the, the production is normally between 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, so we are getting really pretty good numbers, right? But also we need to consider the carbohydrate fraction for feed for animals, right? So in that case, what we what we're going to use, uh, we're going to use seaweed and especially ulva lactuca and sargassum. Sargassum is the most common algae, uh, common seaweed in the Red Sea. There are massive forests. There is a lot of potential. Unfortunately, there are no uh, companies that they are um, uh, harvesting from the wild this, this sargassum. I think that is a big opportunity because sargassum is one of uh, one of the algae that is used. Uh, to produce carbohydrate fraction. Ulva we're gonna use and we're gonna uh, currently build in the facility at NACWA. We're gonna use Ulva in order to double check the bioremediation of this algae and uh, to use uh, some high value metal metabolite that is called Ulban and, and to use the, the carbohydrate fraction too for the inclusion in feed for annual. Uh, I need to highlight as well that uh, with microalgae and macroalgae, we also can produce biostimulant for plants, which is a, a, a really trendy uh, in, in Europe because uh, most of the, um, the companies that they are producing biostimulant, they're selling a lot because they have a lot of properties. So from ulva and sargassum, we also can produce uh, biostimulant for plants, not only for uh, carbohydrate for animals. So uh, what we are now, now we are building, uh, uh, currently building uh, a four hectare in cows, right? So this is, uh, as you can see, uh, it's gonna be a, a, a massive microalgae uh, plant. Uh, actually, it's gonna be one of the biggest in the world. Uh, we will have around 3,300 cubic meter of, of, of culture. We will have uh, mainly, um, uh, Arthrospira, but also other uh, uh, species in, in closest system. The idea is to have uh, GM facilities too, and uh, all this will be connected to a, a fish hatchery. So we will apply the IMTA concept, integrated multitrophic uh, aquaculture, by using the wastewater from the fish in order to feed our uh, ponds, right? This is coming back for the warm up and the production. So these are the projected numbers, right? So as, as, as you can see, we will be able to produce around 80 uh, tons per hectare per year, right? So wh what that means by, by 2030, the, the needs of protein for feed for animal in the kingdom will be around 40 million tons of, uh, uh, of proteins, right? With the current number that we are getting, um, so in, we can produce uh, around uh, 83 million tons of biomass, microalgae biomass. If, and if we consider around 50% content, we can produce around uh, 41 million tons of proteins, right? But in order to achieve this, uh, we need to have at least 100,000 hectares of culture, of microalgae culture. And also, this will, be, uh, uh, will create around 200,000 jobs in rural areas. Uh, how it should look? Uh, so we have mapping all the potential uh, areas in the Red Sea Gulf and in the Arabic Gulf. As you can see, we have put mainly uh, all the, uh, this facility next to a thermal power plant because the main uh, nutrient source for us is carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and, and CO2. Uh, we have a lot of resources in the kingdom. So as you can see, uh, and this is a projection of how it will look. So we will be connected to a, a thermal power plant that will feed the CO2 to our uh, algae plant. Uh, and, and basically, by, by doing this, uh, there will be several gains. So in terms of gover governmental gains, it, it's gonna improve the food security, uh, reinforce the Saudi Green Initiative, reach the vision 2030 in terms of food security, and improve the green cre credential of the country. Economics, so we will produce uh, nearly 44 million tons of biomass uh, a year uh, uh, um, projected by, by <laughs> 2030. Uh, it's a business that potentially is gonna be 2.1 2 billion a year, 200,000 job creation. Environmental gain, we wanna treat a lot of seawater. Uh, we, we're gonna be able to uptake uh, around